Good evening. Oh, let's try that again. Good evening. My name is David Vasquez Levy. I am president here at Pacific School of Religion. It is a delight to have all of you here tonight as we gather for a conversation about reimagining democracy, having a say in our future. Welcome to Pacific School of Religion. You know, in polite company, you're not supposed to talk about politics, sex, or religion. We are fixated with all three. And we gather here because it is important that we find ways to talk about the things that motivate, animate, infuriate, and hopefully transform the way we live in community. It, this conversation tonight started a good while ago. It started in a conversation between myself and our academic dean, Susan Abraham, when we realized that there are conversations we need to have on this holy hill, that's the name we call this area around here, this beautiful space that PSR occupies together with a number of other schools in the system of the Graduate Theological Union, that there's a way of which the conversations we are having here need to engage a much broader audience. Our thinking about this began in part for me as well about a year ago in a letter that I co-signed along with a number of other people as part of the California Economic Mobility Coalition. The letter we wrote was to Governor Newsom as he began his term in California. To him we said, California has suffered an economic earthquake. On one side of the fault line, we have seen the greatest accumulation of wealth in history. On the other, the effects have been devastating. This divide, has led us to a place in which many of us feel deeply discouraged and unable to imagine how to bridge this divide. The absence of a vision of the possible has led many of our social communities and agencies and individuals to settle for band-aid solutions that perhaps will ameliorate the suffering and the effects, but it's difficult to imagine a real solution. We can make a list of what those topics may be. Housing. Can we actually solve this issue? On your way here, you may have driven into Berkeley, one of the wealthiest areas in the country, by a tent city of people living on the streets. And the challenge is we are so overwhelmed by some of these things, we do not know how to solve them. So this is where the conversation started, with the sense that we needed to be able to engage a conversation that was rooted in what we do, Again, to quote Susan again, I do at that a lot. Here on Holy Hill at Pacific School of Religion, our prob religion is our problem. That means it is the issue we are most consumed by as we think about it. It's also our problem because religion often does become a dividing issue for many of our issues. And rather than providing solutions, it can sometimes aggravate them. It is interesting that Holy Hill, this set of seminaries, Theological schools in this area are in Berkeley. I don't know if you're aware of the fact this is the largest theological, theological consortium in the world. Very few people would think that that would be in Berkeley, California, but here we are. In writing this letter to Governor Newsom and participating with others in calling for a way to think differently about this, we recognize that the solutions and our ability to imagine them cannot happen in isolation. That what we need is our capacity to have a much more cross-sectoral discussion, not only about the issues, but also about the solutions we might imagine together. So that gave rise to the idea of saying, you know, we are a very progressive. If you think about a spectrum of religious institutions, and you know, here's right and here's the left, Pacific School of Religion is somewhere over here, way to the left. And we are extremely good at making analysis of things that are wrong in the world and to call them out. And so we will do this about lots of different issues. But part of it is if we're going to engage a conversation of things that are wrong in the world, we must do it with those who know it best. So if we're going to be critical of the economy, we should be engaging with some of the top people in the world who understand the economy. If we're going to think about the consequences of 
technology. We should do it in conversation with people who are experts in the area of technology. If we're going to think about race and its implications in society, we must do it not in isolation, but in that conversation. So what I hope has encouraged you to be here tonight is an interest in having that kind of conversation that is cross-sectoral, but that thinks about what is the rootedness that will help us think about this work. As we started our school year here this week, uh, and we did orientation, I did what I always do when we begin the school year. I say to our students that at Pacific School of Religion, we commit to doing three things. That our exp your experience of education at PSR should blow your mind, it should embolden your heart, and it should strengthen your hands. What we are committed to doing as an institution, and what I hope our conversation over this semester will do for us together, is to blow our mind, to help us think in a much bigger picture about what the issues of the world are, to place it into what in this institution we might call theological, meaning big picture claims about what might be a larger view of the world. To think about what will embolden our hearts, what will strengthen our ability to draw from a deeper well to sustain the work of our communities and our transformation. And finally, to become more skilled, to strengthen our hands and have better ability to transform and bring about the world we ambition. So as we started this conversation, we thought, you know, we should make a list of some of the top people we would think of in the areas we care deeply about. And so we made a very long list because we thought it would take a while to get to anybody that would agree to come and spend some time with us. Our proposal was that they would come and engage with us not just on a one night event, but in a sustained conversation over the period of a year. The good news is that actually pretty much the top people we went to said yes, and we were gratified for that. And so that's how we've ended up with the folks who are with us here tonight and that will be shaping their conversation for this semester here that I hope you will be a part of, not just tonight, but throughout this next couple of months. And so we, that's the way we arrived at people like Pat Klopp, who is the co-founder of the North Face, and we'll have a little bit more of an introduction of him. Ruman Chowdhury, who uh, is the global lead for artificial intelligence with Accenture. And Jeff Chang, who is uh, the vice president for narrative at Race Forward and the founder of Color Lines magazine. To be fully transparent, there was one person who said no. That was uh, Governor uh, Willie Brown. He had just retired and decided that he wasn't quite up to it yet. Uh, he had made some commitment at a little school down the hill here somewhere, Berkeley or something. But anyway, the conversation tonight is enriched by the presence of those folks who have joined us. What we finally arrived at as well is what is the conversation we should have when we come together for this sustained discussion? And as it is probably obvious by now, as we gather tonight, three words frame our conversation as we started. Iowa, acquittal, and the state of the union. Our topic for these couple of months will be how do we have a say over our future? How do we think about democracy? Not just as what happens every four years and we hope we choose the right person out of a group. But democracy much more broadly understood as the ability of a community to have a say over their future. How do we have a say over the use of our technology, of our data? particularly for communities of color? How do we have a say over our employment and the way that our companies impact the world around us? How do we have a say over the imagination that shapes a vision of the future? That is the exercise of democracy. I hope that tonight you will have a chance to see and begin to imagine a conversation that is cross-sectoral, that is spiritually rooted in a way that is more expansive than just, you know, this is what God looks like and you're going to learn this about God. But rather this idea that humans at their heart and at their best aspire for something much larger than themselves. And I hope that the conversation tonight will give you part of what we all need right now, which is a sense of hope about the world an imagination of what could be possible. We won't get there tonight alone, completely, and get it all done. But my hope is that tonight we'll invite you to think about 
continue in this conversation with us for the semester. Because over these next few months, there will be a lot of other events in addition to Iowa acquittal and the State of the Union. And we will need a place to come together and talk across sectors and difference about how we process this and have a say on how we shape our future, regardless of what happens on November. Because while it is important that we make a major shift, at least in the mind of many of us, in November, the reality is that there is work to be done no matter who ends up winning the election in November. So we invite you tonight to be here and then every Wednesday between now and the end of this semester to come back. Uh, there's information at your places about how to participate in the remainder of our conversation throughout. But uh, I want to say thank you for being here with us tonight. My deep appreciation to many folks who have made this night possible. Uh, for faculty and staff here at PSR who have uh, really gone all out to create this conversation and this space to shape a very unique public discussion. Our vision for this conversation is that we do have a number of students who will be taking this class as a course throughout the semester, but our hope is that those of you who are not students will be part of what is a public course. The conversation will be enriched by the participation of people. And you can do that by showing up to one event, as you do tonight, or for a sequence of them, depending on where your interest lies and where your availability is. I want to invite you to help me in welcome, in, in, in welcoming our academic dean, Susan Abraham, to share a little bit more about the vision of our course and this program. Well, welcome, everybody. I join President David Vasquez-Levy in extending a heartfelt welcome to all of you here at PSR this evening. My job today is to give you a sense of how this evening will transpire and also certain logistical details that you may be wanting to know. The most important thing, I think, is do you have a moment where you can share your voice? You have a little piece of paper, a little note card, an index card on your, on, your, on your seats or next to you. Please write down questions and thoughts. They will be collected by our volunteers, and I will look through them. And we will have a conversation. It is my firm belief that the academy is at its best when we are students together. Not when we are teaching but when we are students together. And that is why we have invited these conversation partners to be with us. We are engaged in a conversation. I grew up in India. When I was growing up, my dream was to go to America because I had heard in America, women are free. Uh, poor people are free. Uh, you can become the best you want to be if you just work hard. That was 30 years ago. And I'm asking you today, from one democracy to the other, the world's largest and most bumbly democracy, that is my home, and this particular democracy that is, I think, transforming in a certain way. And I'm asking you today, are you willing to shape the democracy for our children? That is what we are doing here. It is urgent business. It is necessary business. And we cannot do it by staying in our own safe spaces. In fact, as I say to my students many times, there are no safe spaces in the academy. But what we can afford to do is to be brave. So there are brave spaces in the academy. This conversation is an example of that. Let me introduce everybody to you, and I will start at that end. Uh, I am very proud to introduce my colleague here at PSR, Professor Johanna Juncker, who is our faculty associate in art, spirituality, and theology. She is an artist in her own right and has is an amazing thinker and person. She will be working with Professor Jeff Chang, who is our, one of our professors of practice, 
and let me read to you who he is. You know who he is, but I will say a little bit here. Jeff Chang is an American journalist and music critic on hip hop music and culture. He has numerous writings and his particular focus is on how multicultural America can deepen its commitment to multiculturalism. Next to him is Professor Hap Klopp, who we are very excited to welcome as well. Uh, Professor Klopp co-founded the North Face and turned it into a global apparel business and a leading business in corporate social responsibility. He is convinced that we can do business with a social emphasis and turn a profit. This is a very critical conversation for the academy. Academics like to think that, you know, we don't want to get our hands dirty and we, you know, ideas are so much safer. We need this conversation. We want to understand how we can get into a different way to have conversations. So welcome, Professor Klopp. Next to Professor Klopp, <clears throat> we have Professor Ruman Chowdhury. Professor Chowdhury's passion lies at the intersection of artificial intelligence and humanity. She's currently the global lead for responsible AI at Accenture Applied Intelligence. Each will talk to you about their particular course and what they will do for the four weeks that they will be presenting here at PSR. But next to Professor Chowdhury is my colleague, uh, Professor Randall Miller, who is a, who's faculty associate in ethics and theology. Professor Miller will be shaping the conversations with students who are taking these courses for credit. Our idea was this. There are multiple levels of conversation that we need to have. There is a conversation between us. There is a conversation with you. There is the conversation with students, our most prized resource, the people who will actually change the world, the people for whom we exist. And that particular piece is really the most, I would say, precious part of this conversation. So what I want to do this evening is to engage the panel in a conversation. We are all academics here, and you know what happens when academics get mics in their hands. You do know that. So uh, thank God for my mother's face, which is pasted on me. So I have ways in which we will try not to do that, because we also want to hear from you. It really is a conversation. Once we finish that conversation, if you're interested in more conversation with the rest of us, uh, about PSR, about our mission, or about how you can continue to participate, we will move to a reception later, and we will give you instructions about that. So welcome again. Are we ready to begin? Yeah. Great. Excellent. So I'm going to start with an open question to the panel, and I'm just going to ask you, anyone can begin. Do you have any reflections on the state of democracy in the world today? from your particular intellectual orientation? I, I suppose I can start. Um, I guess it's on. Yes, it is. Um, so I, I suppose from my interesting that you ask about sort of orientation and background, um, I am a data scientist by background, but I'm also a social scientist. And my graduate work was actually in American politics. So Lots of thoughts in the state of democracy, and it's actually the, <laughs> but it's also the kind of the focus of my course um, here at PSR. Uh, I'm thinking specifically about technology and how it influences democratic processes, um, and in some cases, what we're seeing is a chilling effect on the right to peaceful protest. Uh, you know, one of the things, one of the core things about democracy is actually it allows for minority voices to be heard. Uh, Thomas Jefferson wrote about the tyranny of the majority. So I think sometimes there's a misunderstanding of a pure, pure democratic process as being what the majority says. But actually the way that um, you know, representative government, such as the US government, was constructed was actually to respect the voices of minorities. My fear is that introduction of a lot of surveillance technologies are actually um, having a chilling effect on minority rights and the ability to actually legally protest and exercise their legal democratic rights for fear of retribution. Any 
responses to that from the panel? My view is a little bit different. Uh, my background is primarily in business as an entrepreneur and a teacher of such. But uh, what I've looked at over the course, and you can see by my gray hair that it's been a long course, that there has been a change, a decrease in terms of civility. There's been a discourse that no longer exists and that is harming our country, is harming individuals, and is leading to a sense of despair. And if one takes where I was when I was 30, and, and I'm not that now, and project to today, yeah, and extra <laughs> extrapolate that into the future for another 40 years, it is unsustainable. And one can either accept that, or try to do something about it. So. The, when you look at the perspective that I had, I, I learned, I, I worked with a gentleman at North Face. Uh, he was outside, but he came in and helped us revolutionize the old tent. Uh, and his name is Buckminster Fuller. Very interesting philosopher, genius, uh, brilliant man. But he told me one thing, which was all of the great ideas come in the valley between disciplines. And over the last few years, I've been reflecting on the echo chamber that we live in right now, right and left. Uh, religion versus anti-religion, and what I found is there's no longer a, a discourse going on. And people listen to their channel, and in today's world where you have 50 channels, it isn't just Fox versus CNN or MSNBC. Everybody finds their own little sinecure, and they go along, and they talk to the same people. And so what I've seen is that there's a need to bring people together as we and you can do it in the business world in, and take the business world. Most people think business has no heart. Uh, if you look at what's happened in San Francisco, uh, if people are making two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year walking by the homeless on the street and saying it's somebody else's problem. No, it's all our problem. It's not theirs alone, but we have to come together. So my perspective is one: business can be good. Uh, but it needs to be employed to get there, and, and business is going to find it like society by actually having a discourse of something. So uh, I hope to try to facilitate that. I'm not sure what the solution is, but I think if we work with a group of people, that small start will multiply. And just like the North Face, when I started, we had 14 people. And uh, it, you know, it's now a $3 billion company. I'm not involved any longer, but you, you don't start at $3 billion. You start small. And the problems that we have, the solutions that have come for them, are also going to be small. So maybe that's what we're going to have here. Um, maybe I'll start by saying that I, I share a lot of the same concerns that uh, Hap and Roman and David and uh, Susan share about democracy and where it's going. Um, I, uh, I am lucky enough to be working in the culture. I started off uh, as a community organizer, as somebody who was working in policy uh, and politics. And, um, and then I, I, at some point, did sort of a, uh, a little bit of a U-turn and got involved um, in music, in running a record label, in writing, um, and became sort of somebody who was more wedded to the arts. I think they relate to each other. Um, I think public policy, I think judicial decisions, legislation, uh, those kinds of things set the sort of parameters of what's possible and what's not possible in society. But culture sets the norms, right? Culture sets the norms. And, and, uh, and so what I've devoted myself to, I think, over the last however many years, uh, has been to work in the culture. Uh, one of the things that me and a lot of the folks that I work with say all the time is that cultural change precedes political change. Um, that you have to have the imagination to think about something uh, and make that manifest, right? So that an idea uh, needs to take root amongst people first. And that happens in the culture, in fact, one of the things that we also say is that the basic unit of change is a story or, or maybe an image, which contains many stories, right? Or maybe a song, an organized set of sounds, right? Which in itself is a story in of itself. But that's the basic unit of change. And so um, if we work from that, then we're able to understand how we can strategically 
actually leverage that to, to be able to make change. And that, I think, gives me hope um, amidst the, you know, the, the kind of things that, that the two of you uh, are seeing amidst the, the disasters of the last three days of what we're all feeling like we're up against. Um, and it's also a renewable resource, right? Uh, art is something that, that gives us pleasure and renews us to be able to, to step up the fight. So my uh, course will follow the, uh, the lead of Ruman and Hap. Um, and in the last four weeks, we'll be looking at the role of arts in democracy and the role of artists in democracy and make all of you uh, or raise up all of you to be the artists that you are yourselves as well. Yes. Um. Um, so I believe that the conditions for democratic practice right now are dire. If we look across the global south and um, what's happening in Latin America, which is reflexive of what's happening in the global north. But I do believe that the arts are sort of a laboratory for exercising our democratic um, rights and creating relevant forms of thought, um, as is religion. Um, and it's also a place where we can rehearse the revolution. So if I think across um, periods of time, you know, the coalescing of art, religion, and activism is nothing new. Um, I, I look at Jesus's overturning of the tables um, as a, a perfect example of political theater at its best. Um, and so if we're thinking um, along these lines as the arts, religion, um, activism as a place where we can exercise imagination and sort of conjure up new ways of being in the world. Um, I believe that we're doing um, something that, you know, is bringing about not only change, but the sense of hope, the sense of healing from all the wounds that neocolonialism um, and other forms of settler colonialism and neocapitalism, all of these things um, are doing to our very bodies. Um, so as, as laboratories, you know, for democracy, um, I believe in what Toni Morrison said, that this times of crises are times in which we artists get to work, where we come together, fashion spaces, where we can have continued conversations and sustained conversations about our um, sort of role in the democratic um, process that we are engaged with, and we can think of other ways of affecting change and, and bringing about transformation. Thank you. I just wanted to start by saying I'm just marveling at hearing the voices of the professors of practice, because we've been working by email and Zoom, most of it. Uh, and so uh, I have this sort of strange feeling that I've heard your voices a lot, but I'm, getting, I'm remembering it's been mostly by email and by... I think uh, it's the first time we're all on the same screen. It's exactly the same. <laughs> uh, and so I think what's really exciting about um, the three courses that are being offered and the discussion tonight is it's not just about re reimagining the formal structures and systems of democracy. It's also about reimagining democratic engagement and participation. And it, assu it assumes that democracy um, uh, is grounded in our willingness uh, to be uh, involved change makers and to participate uh, mostly, hopefully, in good ways. But good, bad, or in different ways, we get the democracy that we deserve. Um, and um, also, I think uh, a thread that I... Eventually. Yeah, eventually, yes. Well, we, we may have the democracy we deserve. <clears throat> uh, we'll talk more about that. Uh, but uh, another thing that surfaced, I think, in all of the comments that you've made in your development of syllabi are the hidden movements, at least, that are somewhat hidden to us that now threaten democracy. So in particular, thinking about Ruman, I haven't spent much time thinking about artificial intelligence and its implications for democracy. But in reading through the readings that she provided uh, and some of the script that she provided for the course, it becomes very clear that if we don't engage in a kind of new digi digital advocacy, which is different for most of us, uh, our democracy might be lost uh, because so many of these things are out of our hands. So, 
this new moment of democratic engagement and democratic participation, I think, is what's really exciting about all this. And sort of related to what you're talking about, I mean, one of the reasons why the Iowa caucus was delayed was because of the, the use of an, an app. This is not even artificial intelligence, it's just an app. <laughs> There's not a lot of intelligence in it. Human, human intelligence. Yeah. You know, so you're, you're thinking about this state of democracy and the power of a story. I love that image, Jeff, of the, this is the, the, this, the, the, the minimal unit of change. And I think about, like, you know, sort of chain theory or, you know, like you, you have the ability to create change by all of these various changes. So can these bones live? Now, this is a phrase from a story that I've been thinking a lot about over the last several months, in part because I lead an educational institution. It comes from a story in the sacred text of the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, and it's this a prophet, Ezekiel, is taken to a valley of bones. So it's a entire valley full of dry bones. And the text is, they were very dry. So, and he hears this voice after he's been swooped into this dry valley that says, mortal, can these bones live? That's what it feels like to me, the state of democracy. You know, that I feel surrounded often by a valley of very dry bones. And that question, the prophet is smart enough to respond to this voice which he identifies as God and says, oh Lord, only you know. Now, that may be the place where we feel ourselves, depending on our particular religious or personal ideas, about responding to say, I really have no clue. And I have felt that way about many of the issues, and certainly in the last couple of nights. What's interesting in the story is that the prophet isn't allowed to stay in that space. His job is not simply to describe these bones, how dry they are, to catalog them and count them, his job, the voice comes back and says, mortal, speak to these bones. Now, in that story, it says, tell them the word of the Lord. That's a tricky thing, right? Who gets to speak for God? Who gets to decide what the answer is? But the invitation and challenge to the prophet is that it isn't enough to describe and to be critical and to analyze. When he does dare to at least speak, to say something, what starts happening is some rattling, and these bones begin to connect one to the other. You probably know the African-American spiritual, them bones. They begin to rattle and take shape, because there is connections being made in that valley that you referred to between spaces where creativity happens. Now, that's part of the process of being a democracy, is how do we build and knit the resistance, make connections across things that are trying to separate us that make us feel like very dry bones. But what's interesting in the story, if you allow me to preach one more second, I'm not hearing any amens, but we'll get there, <laughs> is the next thing it says that the spirit will blow through these bones. Now, we have different perspectives in this room about what that may mean. But I think we can all resonate with the idea that connectivity is important, analysis is important, but ultimately we do need a wind to blow through, to bring these things into life. And I think that the state of democracy is difficult, and yet my conviction it remains that it is through our ability to dare to speak about a vision of something with whatever caveats we need to, but to begin to imagine the possibility of a wind blowing through to make these things come alive. And they are, what the text ends up with saying is, it is a multitude. There isn't a single way in which this happens, but it is a multitude of all these various pieces coming together in different ways, those small efforts. Well, thank you for that. I'm wondering, since religion has been invoked a little bit, in terms of um, what Professor Miller said, we get the democracies we deserve. Do we get the religions we deserve? And if that's the case, do they help democracy or hinder it? <laughs> can, can we do that next year? <laughs> like, we've already got like... A lot of stuff lined up for this semester. Oh, so I'll, 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 I'll maybe throw something out there. Um, 
The problem, the problem is not necessarily religion, it's dogma, it's dogmatic. Mm -hmm. and, and we know whether it's dogma as, um, as Hap was saying, like blindly adhering to some sort of political party or, or ideologue or individual, no matter what he or she says or does, um, or whether it's like blindly clinging to outdated laws or blindly clinging to uh, an outdated religious text that may say something that is not uh, in adherence with the way society has evolved. I think that that really is the problem. Um, institutions are not fundamentally bad things, whether it's religion, whether it's school, whether it's government. The problem is sort of the, the ossification and the dogmatic approach that some people may take to them. And, and I, th I think at least the thesis that I'm working on in my class is one of the problems we have is division, divisions of people. They're defining themselves as representing something and everybody on the outside is wrong. And religion falls into that category. It threatens people in some cases and people say we're right and wrong. As soon as you impose right and wrong on something, you immediately get defensiveness going out there. And, and so what we have to break down is let's have a dialogue irrespective of where you're coming from and as I was saying earlier, you know, in this valley between disciplines, we can come up with solutions. Because many of the problems we're facing right now are not new. They just appear new. But when you look at them in the context of where we've been, we faced that before. And if we can bring some historical perspective, we may reverse the pessimism, or at least arrest the pessimism, to the point of saying, yes, maybe we can do that. If, if the right people come together, we can come up with these solutions. And some of that's going to come from the secular world. Some of it's going to come from the religious world. Some of that is going to come from communities other than the one we have in the US. But if we can draw those together so that we don't just fall back on sort of our knee-jerk reaction about any of it, whether it's about, being, about a religion, about a specific religion, about a political party, any of those. I guess maybe just to kind of build on, on Ruman and Hap's comments, um, I, I, I think that there needs to be, and I think this is something that religion often, not always, but often does a good job at, is there needs to be sort of an ethics of, of, of identity. There needs to be uh, a way in which uh, we, we think of ourselves as belonging to each other. And I think that that's, you know, one of the questions that we were prompted here is what's most threatening democracy right now, right? I think that that's actually the normalization of this sort of toxic individualism um, is, is, I think, the, the biggest threat that we're, that we're uh, encountering at this particular moment, right? This, this idea that we don't belong to each other, that it's really just about uh, who can win this game and have the most whatever things you accumulate um, you know, by the time your time's up. Uh, uh, that kind of morality is not the kind of morality that, that we, you know, should be seeking at this particular point. And it's less religion, I think, than, than um, the way to try to find um, the connections, right? To, to be able to, to, to make those bones live uh, and, to, and to have those bones come together to, to, to reform um, the body, right? The, the, the collective body um, that, we, that we are. Uh, that's what we've, I feel like we've lost the most of in the last uh, three years. Um, I can tell you how old I am. I, I can tell you how old I am. Uh, when, when I went, 32. I went to Stanford Business School, I went to undergraduate, and I went into business many years ago. And it never dawned on me at that time that you would have to teach ethics in business. Uh, you know, and now people say, oh, we better have an ethics. I'm going, give me a break. I mean, it's just logic. It's common sense. And we've gotten to the point where we have to teach it, which scares me, because if you have to teach it, you're starting in the wrong place. Shouldn't we start somewhere else uh, with that ethics? But anyway. It's good they teach it, but uh, I was surprised that you had to. So Jeff, I actually have a question for you. So in terms of, I think it sort of ties in what uh, the themes of what all three of us are, are doing. Um, you know, I loved your point earlier about how you know culture and, and you know shapes our norms. Um, actually, I was like literally the Australian Human Rights Commissioner said, uh, you know, norms and values shape our laws. 
um, which is, and that's absolutely true, it starts from culture. One thing about culture, though, um, and a lot of our narratives, particularly stories, movies, um, there is a hero worship. So there's this really wonderful Rebecca Solnit piece that I found very inspirational. It's called When the Hero is a Problem. And I was kind of running into it. I had sort of a, a, um, a, a sort of a, a moment of self-reflection in this whole like technology and ethics space, which has become you know super popular. And frankly, you know, it's easy to become a, like a celebrity in, in this world of tech ethics. Like you can you know, get on the cover of magazines. Everyone I know has written a New York Times op-ed. And, and, but what that misses, and everyone's looking for this like hero to save us from the evils of technology, when actually the answer is often collective action, collective yeah. movements. So what are your thoughts on you know, sort of the, the media that does drive our minds? Actually, so much of our technological fear and pessimism comes from Terminator, how, right, the stories that shaped us. So like, what are your thoughts on sort of this technological pessimism, but also this other narrative of like heroes will save the day. We were just talking about this today that, that uh, you know, like I, I am in deadly fear of Alexa and Siri. <laughs> and, and what was the Google, what's the Google, whatever the Google one is. No, that's Microsoft. Is it, anyway, we're, we were talking, I, because I saw Ex Machina, and I was like, ah. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, I, I um, I hear that. I, I think that. I think that um, the. You know, there's that, and then there's there's actually J Lo and Shakira at the Super Bowl, <laughs> right? Who uh, are are getting up uh, and you know J Lo kind of ripping open the Puerto Rican flag, right? Uh, as as an, expli- as an explicitly political statement. So I think that, you know, I, I was struck by um, David invoking the, the notion of the multitude, yeah. right? Which has been uh, a, term, a term that's kind of refloated back into sort of left circles over the last decade or so. Um, and this notion of, 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 of Occupy, you, you mentioned, you know, these places occupying Holy Hill and the notion of how occupation, right? Like noting the, 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 the dual terms of occupation, what occupation means for those of us who have like native blood and what occupation means for those of us who uh, were seeking new narratives beginning in 2011. Um, and so I think that that's partly what's at, what's at work here in the culture right now is that there's actually this toxic masculinity, toxic individualism that's kind of, um, you know, reinforced by Hollywood and all these other different types of, 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 of narrative producers, of narrative machines. Um, maybe I shouldn't use machine in that kind of a way. <laughs> but I, I'm going to take your class and find out. Um, versus these images and these notions of of the multitude, of the 99%, right? Of black lives that matter, of, of Standing Rock, of, you know, the, of, of, of on and on and on, right? Uh, of Me Too. Um, and, and so uh, this feels like a moment in which those are actually, you know, sort of the narratives that are doing battle um, within the culture right now. And I think that, you know, our job is to, to Tony K. Bambara said, you know, the, the job of the artist is to make the revolution irresistible, going back to, right, to, to what you're talking about. So, so it's our job to kind of make those uh, narratives, like, stick. Be so deep and so transformative that we just naturally gravitate towards that instead of Iron Man. It's really funny. I used to start all my talks saying there are three things I don't talk about. Terminator, Hal, and Silicon Valley entrepreneurs saving the world. And it was actually Elon Musk in an Iron Man costume because, like, you know, people always make that parallel of him being (laughs) Iron Man. Thank you. I'm wondering with the three professors of practice, uh, prior to meeting us at PSR, had you ever been to a seminary? That's question number one. Question number two, why did you say yes to us? <laughs> had you ever been to a seminary? And why- yeah, I, I, I had never been to a seminary in my life, so uh, no. <laughs> um, but I, what got me to say yes is that, you know, I get this email from David, I'm just like, what? Eh? understand. Uh, 
but then I did a little bit of Googling and I looked into, you know, David's background, Randall's background, Susan, your background. I was like absolutely floored at the, the work you had done. Uh, my, my shorthand for when like, you know, people in my circle are like school of religion. I'm like, no, no, no. So it's like, it's like, it's like religion the way God intended it to be. <laughs> This is like the go out and help people religion, not like, you know, chastise people and tell them they're going to hell religion. Uh, that's kind of my... my we do a little bit of that too, though. <laughs> Uh, that's sort of my shorthand of explaining to my, you know, mostly atheistic friends uh, what, what I am doing, teaching a course at a at a school of religion. Um, but no, it, it's that's uh, honest truth. That's that's exactly uh, how I thought of in this general process. And then what happened was David and I actually met in in my office, and you know he was like talking a lot about like you know just the stuff he'd been working on. And literally at that moment, I had been writing this document of all the things that I'm like interested in and working on, and it was verbatim what was coming out of David. And I looked at David and I'm like, I'm going to turn my laptop around and show you exactly what I've been writing for the past few hours. And it was like, you know, so I, it was clear that this was, you know, something. And, and I should give a little background about this. So it was funny. First, you know, all transparency here, when we first started talking about this in our faculty and the idea that we would bring into conversation, again, keep in mind, very, very liberal theological institution. We're going to be talking with people who are in the corporate world. It's funny to know exactly who in technology. So when I went to meet with Roman the first time, we met in her office or outside of her office in the Salesforce Tower, which by the way, the Salesforce Tower sort of represents for many of the imagination sort of like the iconography of what's wrong with. It's like, <laughs> it's like the, the eye of Sauron. Exactly, which was a really, a, so that's exactly, if you remember, that's exactly. Surveiling all of the Bay Area. And that's exactly what I said, if you remember this, when we met, I said, I feel like I am coming to the Tower of Mordor to return the ring. <laughs> like this is not the place where we are supposed to be, but we needed to create a valley for conversation. <laughs> Well, I religiously avoided going to a seminar. <laughs> Actually, I left that to my older brother. He does that all the time. So, you know, like siblings, whatever your brother does, you don't do it. Uh, but the, the answer to that is that the reason that I was intrigued by coming in is, one, some of the diversity that would be offered that I don't have. The second thing is an awful lot of people that I talk to, I, I teach at a business school called HALT and I do adjunct teaching at Stanford and Cal, they aren't really open to teaching more than the subject matter that is there. And I think what we're talking about is something that falls outside the guardrails of what they're doing. And when David and others started talking about the flexibility to be able to bring that in, even not knowing exactly where we're going to end up at the end of the class, we don't have in my class a goal. We have a path, and we'll see where that goal is. And the ability to, uh, to accept that was very intriguing to me. Uh, your question was really interesting. It made me think that uh, about you know, when I've been in seminaries actually during my life. And I realized um, that I actually had learned community organizing at a seminary. And that through my sort of so-called career, I guess, in, in organizing and activism, that time and again, like, seminaries would be places for us to gather, actually, to strategize, to plan, to learn skills and... and uh, and then to go back out into the world. Um, and I, I had the pleasure, I had the honor, I had the privilege of, of being introduced to the PSR community, um, I guess a couple of years ago, because I, I came in and, and uh, was asked to do the commencement, and, which was a great honor for me. Um, and just knew that this was a community that I, I like my community organizing communities, like my arts communities, uh, that I wanted to, to, to be a part of. And so I'm, I'm just thankful to be here. Yeah. Thank you. Would you like to say a little bit about the courses that you're offering? So we'll be doing four weeks. Um, and uh, we'll be having, uh, it'll be about basically the arts and artists and their role in democracy. Uh, the kinds of issues that arts raises, uh, the kinds of ways that artists approach um, activating democracy uh, in, in a lot of 
uh, ways we think of democracy as moving forward via events, right? Uh, via judicial decisions or via elections. And that's very important, but uh, the artists realize that it's, it's really working in the trenches to change the imaginary every single day. That is, that is what the work is, is really about. So we'll be looking at, um, over the course of four weeks, uh, exploring the idea of cultural strategy, this idea of how we leverage culture and the arts to, to move and, and persuade people and change people's minds. Um, we'll be looking at how artists are helping uh, organizers, communities, people to envision different futures. At this particular moment when the ice caps are melting and uh, we're, we're being surveilled at every corner, it feels like there can't be any future. Um, but how do, we, how do we actually use the tools of the artists to be able to imagine where we want to be? Um, we'll be also looking at uh, how the arts is, is, is rooting people in place, in community. Um, obviously, that's a huge issue here in the Bay Area. And we'll be looking at how the arts uh, moves um, ideas on a big level, ideas like Me Too, right? Um, uh, addressing um, how we, we uh, move on, people on these issues um, in, for the long term, right? Not just around a particular campaign. So we'll be having uh, five artists. We'll be having a field trip to the Betty Ono Gallery, uh, Calvin Williams, Faviano Rodriguez, Evan Bissell, um, and Nayantara Sen, and Anika Barber will be joining us. And it's gonna, you get to be with me and Johanna. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, I would just add to that that I think part of the honor really that we have and this great opportunity to have someone or the three of them teaching this course uh, for us is to really see on the ground how change are sort of being uh, made uh, through their praxis, through their practice. And so we'll get to sort of pick their brains and see um, beyond the academy, beyond seminary, beyond the religious institutions, how change is being crafted and sort of reverse engineering that back to what we're doing in the classroom. So I'm really, really excited to be working alongside you. Well, the course that uh, I'm putting together, which uh, is basically titled Reclaiming Democracy. It's not reimagining, it's reclaiming. Civility versus outrage. Uh, which is the approach to get it done? It, it's very secular, very pragmatic, but how do we get something done? Is civility a solution to that? Is outrage a solution? And take some contemporary topics, and I had a, a, a grander plan, but when I started putting the syllabus together, I realized, reasoned it wouldn't be there. But each week, we'll take a different topic. Me Too is an example. We can talk about uh, the, Hong Kong and the issues there, Black Lives Matter, and, and talk about who's on what side of the issue and why are they there? Because as I found, it, it doesn't make sense that in climate change, it's political. Uh, you know, you can talk about coal or whatever. You know, that's that's small. And so, trying to open up a dialogue and then have people debate. So it'll be lecture coupled with debate. The second half will be taking the students to talk about their view and even take an opposing position. Because what I found is, uh, if you look at something from another perspective you may come up with a different approach. So by having that debate, I think that we can bring something about with the ultimate goal of starting a dialogue. Because what I've heard so many times from people uh, is it's just too complex, there's nothing we can do. Everything is simple when you look at it. There's a story which I tell comes from my business community, but it shows how simple something could be to have a massive impact. This is a story about somebody who was in Tokyo. He was in the Ginza area of Tokyo. And Ginza is all high-rise department stores. Well, it was 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and those of you who experience jet lag know what it is. And he's thinking, if I could just have a cup of coffee, I'll be okay. I'll get caffeine, good to go. But there's no small coffee shops there. So he figures, okay, usually there's a restaurant, I'll go to the top of the, the department store, won't be great coffee, won't be a great experience, but I'll get enough caffeine, I'm good to go for the rest of the day. Well, he goes to the top, and he's immediately impressed because they seat them quickly, and give them a hot towel, and he's thinking, this is pretty good. If we had hot towels with our coffee, maybe more people would do that. 
still not expecting much, but quickly the coffee came out and a very strong aroma was there. And as he looked down on the cup of coffee, there on the top of the cup of coffee was a dollop of cream sculpted like a rosebud. He's going, wow. He started to stir and they said, sir, wait for a moment. And while he waited, the heat of the coffee turned the rosebud into a rose petal. That's the reaction you get. It's that simple. You just have to think about who you're talking to and what you're talking to. And so if we can encourage people who are in the class to speak up, speak up in a way that influences those around those, then I will be pleased with what the class is. So building on the, the two themes we've talked about, um, and as I've mentioned, I'm talking about democracy and surveillance, and in particular how it impacts uh, minority groups. Um, what's really interesting in doing all this research about advanced technologies and cutting edge, you know, thinking of things like facial recognition and emotion detection or whatever, you know, technology, all it is really doing is creating an imbalance of power in with all, in already existing problems in society. So when we talk about surveillance, for example, um, in Los Angeles and the group Stop LAPD Spying, if you ask them what they're doing is they're saying, we're stopping the over-policing and surveillance of black and brown communities. This is not a new narrative. In San Diego, it's about undocumented immigrants, particularly from the Mexican border. Not a new narrative. In New York, it's about the surveillance of sex workers and undocumented immigrants. Not a new narrative. So really what I want to impart on the individuals taking this class is a lot of what we talk about when it comes to technology is really just reshaping uh, and, and frankly creating a further imbalance of power as you know, David was uh, started off uh, talking about. Um, but you know, within our daily lives, within our, the public sphere, uh, my, you know, there, there is something very um, deep happening to our, our civic infrastructure where it's actually being consumed by private organizations. We don't think about it because it's data and we don't see data, we don't feel data. But if, if I were to say our public parks are now owned by Google, you may have a problem with that. And yet all of our civic infrastructure, our information about ourselves is being owned by companies like Google. Um, and it's not just to point the finger at them. The infrastructure is owned by you know, engineering companies you may have never heard of. So uh, my course every week, we're going to talk about a different facet of this technology. Week one, we talk about something as simple as the datification of our lives. What does it mean to measure, to quantify you as a human being and stick you in a database? What does that mean about your, how you are reflected in what is being built? Um, you know, and in subsequent weeks, I, I don't just focus on the U.S. I also talk about this notion of uh, algorithmic colonialism, how the importation of foreign technologies and, and Silicon Valley culture and Chinese technology into the global South is a recolonization of these spaces, of these areas. We're no longer extracting uh, maybe oil or gems or diamonds, but now we are extracting data and literally people's faces and images to train technology to further surveil and control them. Um, another part of my of my course and I'm, I'm, that I want to leave the audience with, I don't want it to be a doom and gloom narrative, I am, even though it sounds like I do, right? But I am bringing in people who are actually driving or have driven change in these movements. So uh, Vina Dubal, who's an uh, amazing lawyer who started her career representing taxi workers, um, who is now uh, advocating for gig workers, in particular Uber and Lyft drivers, who was a big part of getting AB5 passed. Uh, she's going to be speaking. Uh, Brian Hoffer, who is part of protect, uh, a privacy group based out of Oakland. Um, he'll be coming to speak as well. Um, and the class will actually end with a, a workshop to reimagine the surveillance state. My challenge to you is uh, let's reimagine a smart city not as a surveillance state, but as the notion of um, a, 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 digital, a, a digital civic culture, a digital community. So what does that mean? So what does it mean to have digital urban design? What if the notion of a smart city wasn't about uh, safety and security and catching the bad people, which, by the way, by definition is exclusionary, but what if it was actually an extension of urban design? What if it was about merging our analog and digital selves in real time, in real space? Uh, and it's actually an exercise that I've run with different communities and different groups, and I'm excited to see what the students of this course um, provide to that narrative. And by the way, like everything that's produced is something that I actually will end up bringing back. I do a lot of work with 
governments, whether it's the European Union. Uh, you know, I, I go to Capitol Hill quite a bit. I'm in Sacramento. So the things that the students will bring to me are things that I hope will filter upwards to the people who are making the rules, laws, and legislation that will hopefully protect all of us. Thank you. I have one more question to ask, but I would also ask the audience, if you have questions, can you pass it to the corners or to the end of your rows and somebody will collect them and bring them to me? So my last question. Oh, you Actually, I just want to kind of reflect a little bit. So part of what will happen in each of the courses is that we'll have the professors of practice introducing and directing us in a conversation. And then each of us from faculty will be responding so, uh, uh, to them. The kinds of things to think about, for example, you might wonder, like, what, what does religion bring into this conversation? One of the things that struck me uh, in a recent event I was at, and, and I think reflects some of the doom and gloom, it was at an event that is a projection of the future. The Institute for the Future does this 10-year projections. And this was a summit looking at the future, bringing all these different projections together. Of what does the next 10 years look like in the environment, in the food production, in economic inequality? What struck me is the use of the word apocalyptic was everywhere in every one of these things. They had like the top global experts on the environment. And rather than talking about the numbers and the science, they were talking about this race as apocalyptic. Now, there doesn't get much more religious than that. The word itself comes out of a religious tradition, right? And it's an understanding that humans at some point come up against things they do not fully understand. Susan, you've said before, you know, religion is the original uh, virtual reality. Right, so when you come up against something you cannot fully understand, then you try to create an imagination about what it should or ought to be like. To try to understand, if you believe in the divine, an understanding of what it is intended to be. So part of our conversations will be trying to think about these ancient traditions, these ancient stories. You know, when it comes to surveillance, there's a psalm that says, if I go to the mountaintop, you are there. If I go to Sheol, to the bottom, to hell, you are there. Now, if you're okay with God, that's very comforting, right? You can't get away. You know, it says, I can't get away from your presence. But if you're the one being surveilled, then this I who's watching you all the time becomes very problematic, right? And it becomes a complaint about the fact that I can't get away from your presence. Now think about that psalm read in the understanding that now we have technology and companies that basically mimic the way that the ancient ones thought of the divine. But there's the ability now for something to see you everywhere and you cannot get away from it. So how do the ancient ones and the traditions and stories we have received from them help us think about these things? The apocalyptic, the things beyond what we can understand, and this kind of qualities which we have attributed often to the divine that are being embodied in the power of corporations or in the power of technology. Thank you. Uh, let me pick up one of the questions here, which is asking you to think about the role of the body. So bodies are not equal in spaces like ours. Uh, the way we are on the stage right now marks a difference from the way bodies are over there. We know this. But how do we do this in a society where a body is valued differently? So in terms of the, the, you know, all of your practices and intellectual orientations, what do you do with that problem? I feel that, yeah, sure. I feel like it's kind of easy for mine. I mean, my, my first lecture is actually all about data and measurement, and we talk about bodies, and we, and we talk about like what this data is being used for. So I'll touch on things like emotion, right? emotion detection. Um, so the, the notion that uh, this technology can understand things, quote, about you that you don't know about yourself. That's a very common refrain about artificial intelligence. This idea that it's actually smarter than us, it's telling you things about you that you don't even know, including your emotion, your higher ability, your likability, your, your level of criminality your sexual orientation, these are all things that people have claimed they can understand with the use of artificial, uh, artificial intelligence. And here's where diversity of bodies becomes very important. And not just things like uh, you know, race, skin color, et cetera, but even the cultural difference. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll actually I'll give you a really good example. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk of the use of emotion detection in hiring technology. So uh, the most famous is a company called HireVue, uh, and they map certain things about you, and, and it's uh, 
So first of all, the way they train their model is it's trained on the most successful employees at your own company. So you can already see how there could be some sort of a confirmation bias. Uh, if you tend to like and promote certain kinds of people who look and act a particular way, uh, how you would be biasing yourself towards bringing in those same kinds of people, even if how they look, act, talk, or smile is not necessarily related to their performance. Um, but I was talking about it with uh, my colleagues in Finland. So, you know, if, if you know anything about so some of these cultural differences, a lot of Europeans, particularly Germans, Finns, and Eastern Europeans, think Americans often look ridiculous because we smile all the time. Uh, and while in America doing a job interview, you want to smile, you want to be, quote, engaging, uh, in Finland, it's actually the opposite in that if you smile too much, you seem unintelligent. So when you do a job interview, you want to be very stoic. They're very stoic people. You want to be very stoic, very stone-faced, because that means you are serious, you know what you're doing, you know, and this transcends gender. So you think about, like, literally our bodies, our expressions, our emotions, how much it's driven by culture, and how we are assuming this generalizability, this homogeneity with this technology that, quote, oh, yeah, yeah, I can, I can understand things about it. I can understand how likable you are based on your, your expressions, um, which we know to vary so much from, from space to space and culture to culture, and even actually generationally quite a bit. My wife is Finnish, so I'll confirm all of that. She's sitting right here. Very stoic people. <laughs> Happened, uh, well, my answer is not nearly as thorough or as, as well thought out, but, but basically what I think is you've got to get to an intellectual understanding of something and if you don't know where you're going and you don't have any idea where you're going, then you start focusing on meaningless things like body, like differences or whatever. Uh, so what you have to do, once again, I talk about trying to get in this valley between disciplines where intellectually where people are talking about things and not talking about people, you come up to a lot better solution. Um, this is actually a really... A deep question. I don't think I'm going to be able to do any kind of justice. Um, but what I guess I'll say is is uh, that um, in some ways, you know, the the social movements of the last decade uh, have been cultural interventions, and they've been cultural interventions to be able to um, make plain. Um, relations between different bodies. Um, and so Occupy uh, was a movement to make plain, to, to allow people to see in a much different way than surveillance is a kind of seeing, which imposes uh, a set of numbers upon you, uh, algorithms, metrics, these different types of things upon you. Uh, being able to see actually the inverse of that, the the relationship of inequality between the one percent and the ninety nine percent, and Black Lives Matter did something even deeper than that, which is, which was that it. I mean, there's a way to look at this in terms of numbers, right? If you look at if you look at the ultimate metric, which is life expectancy. Right, um, black bodies and native bodies are not going to be here as long as white bodies and Asian bodies and Latinx bodies. Um, that's the number. But what Black Lives Matter did was it changed that around and it said we need to be able to see each other, like really see each other beyond the numbers uh, in terms of uh, what needs to happen in order for us to be able to be moving forward as a country is we need to be able to heal uh, those who have been most impacted by this tyranny of numbers. Um, and I think that, that in that way, um, the question of bodies in terms of the way that we are addressing it um, in the, in the arts is to follow kind of uh, in this cultural renaissance that's um, happened because of Black Lives Matter um, and to be exploring the questions of what, what it means for us to be able to see each other, recognize each other, 
and then figure out ways to belong to each other. Thank you. I think in the questions that I received, a, a, a global question that structures many of them has to do with how shall we achieve more democracy? So as a last question to end the panel discussion, what I would like to ask you and everybody on the panel, what is the most important thing in your view that we can do this election year of 2020? And I know the one word answer to that, but a little bit. <laughs> what? Get yeah, people, people to vote. talk. Well, talk? Okay. Get people to talk. Get out of the echo chamber and talk. I believe in the goodness of people. I know as I'm in a minority these days, but I believe that a lot of people come from a position of wanting to do the right thing, but they have such limited information that they're making decisions without taking in enough of the community ideas to be able to come up with the right answer. So I think it starts with a discussion. It's not going to be solved there, and it's certainly not going to be solved in the next year or before the next election, but everything starts with that first step. Others? That's hard. Um, I mean, uh, to, I guess, find a way to build our collective imagining, mm -hmm. which includes moving beyond just, I mean, we got to vote, but it's beyond that mm -hmm. as well. Mine would be to exercise your rights, uh, no matter how scary it may seem to do so. Uh, we do have protections, we do have rights, and often I think, particularly in the face of something that seems intimidating, whether it's a democratic process, whether it's these big institutions, or whether it's technology, it doesn't seem like we do, but exercising our rights, is, and particularly doing so as a collective, is a, a very, very powerful instrument of change. I would say, you know, and this is maybe a professional liability, is to resist fear. You know, I, I, I just think that, you know, within most religious traditions, the encounters between the humans and divines is always starts out with the phrase, something along the lines of don't freak out. You know, that the, and, 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 and the, the level of fear that we are living with about technology, about each other, about uh, our borders, uh, it, it just dominates so much of our understanding. And I think in raising children, my kids are 14 and 18 years old right now, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of that for them is about trying to imagine a world that is different where balancing the sense of awareness and the naming of the dryness of the bones without allowing themselves to be so fearful that it paralyzes and then leaves the only option to be is, you know, let's see how many toys I can collect before it all blows up. Well, <laughs> um, I think one of the most important things, too, I'll say two things, if that's okay. I think um, I've been thinking about this a lot, and one of the things that I've been giving a lot of attention to is identifying where I am complicit in particular structures of power, in perpetuating particular structures of, of power, and impeding the democratic sort of distribution of power. So I think that's one. And I also think one of the most important things we can do this year is sort of to exercise the political radical power of love. Thank you. So I'm gonna be the skeptic and say <clears throat> that um, one of the things I've been struggling with is it's, it just seems to me that in my lifetime, democratic engagement uh, and its ability to have impact is the most diminished that it has ever been. And so I'm trying to figure out with particularly the new strategies that maybe we can have a beer sometimes, Jeff, uh, whether they are a response to that di diminishment, and that's why we're we're stuck with cultural change versus some other kinds of change, or whether they're the new way forward, and how that translates into a very tangible, concrete electoral vote. 
Uh, and this is the, the conversation, argument, dialogue that I've been having with folks who are younger <laughs> than I am, particularly in Black Lives Matters and some of the other. Um, and I really am struggling with that. Is it, is it a symptom of our the, the diminishment of democratic engagement, engagement or participation, or is it a kind of movement um, that I'm not equipped to understand as a boomer? Mm -hmm. uh, that's what I kind of struggle with. I think the dean should respond to her own question. <laughs> well, that's a dangerous invitation. But I was just thinking, uh, I will be one of the respondents to, uh, I will be responding to Professor Ruman Chowdhury uh, in her course, as will uh, President David Vasquez-Levy will be the respondent to Professor Klopp, and Johanna will be, uh, Johanna Juncker will respond to Jeff Chang. So for me, the issue is we live in an, we live in a culture where we are, how to say, there is a glut of information. There is so much, so much to know that the way we filter it is through our preferences. And, and we have to question that. We might think just because we are on the left and because we are all, you know, nicey-nicey uh, that this is right. In fact, we are so convinced of our moral rightness that we cannot hear what another is saying. And to me, as an educator, that is a very dangerous situation. But as a religious thinker, and this is where the little discomfort might come in, information is something that I would imagine God laughs at. I mean, what is it after all? We human beings are like ants, right? If, if you compare yourself to, let's say, a bigger being, we think we know. But do we really know? And what do we know? In the glut of information, maybe it is time for religion to make a move. I absolutely agree with Professor Chowdhury. Dogmas, doctrines, the insistence on us being right has really been a huge problem of religion. But what we did best was to tell stories. We have to re-mythologize the world. We have to tell stories. And see, stories are funny. They're not about the truth. They're explorations of human love, human desire, human creativity, human community. And that is what I think is the time for religion to do. So if I were to answer my own question, in 2020, in one year, I want to re-mythologize the world. <laughs> uh, things have been done in the past. It can be done. So having said that, I would actually like to draw us to a close. But in order to draw us to a proper close, I'm going to invite Professor Miller to come and talk about closing the courses and our reception at the body. Well, thank you for coming. You know, honestly, I was waiting for the rest of the question to be answered. <laughs> so I was just settling in, but the time is over. Um, so first, I want to thank all of you for coming tonight and to this kickoff of this focused time of thinking about how we can reimagine uh, democracies. And as you've heard, we have three outstanding professors of practice, each of them digging deep into an aspect of uh, democracies and engagement in a way I think that's really interesting. Uh, and then we have uh, superlative uh, theological reflectors and responders joining with them for each class. So the first thing I want to say to you is that the first class starts next week, uh, and there's still plenty of time to, if you're interested in joining that class, to join it formally, or to drop by and attend a session or so just to get a better feel of the class. Uh, and they'll go through the rest of the semester. Each one of them is four weeks, roughly four weeks long, uh, and we'll have a closing uh, uh, event similar to this kickoff event on uh, May 13th, which I hope you all will be here to uh, talk with us about what we've learned and to do some more imagining 
uh, because we'll know even more about our democracy in uh, in uh, eight we or twelve weeks or so. Um, uh, it's really important, I think, that all of us take to heart our role uh, as members of the body politic. Uh, and that means uh, both uh, reimagining the culture, the, the structures, but also in some crucial ways, putting our bodies on the line, right? If this is not the year to put our bodies on the line for the democracy that we reimagine, then we, what, when will be that time? Now, we can't tell you what it means to put your, uh, your particular body on the line. It may mean that our digital selves move forward much, for, much further than we can do individually. But this might be the time, to, uh, along with our reimaginations, to put our bodies on the line. We have a wonderful reception after this that's in the Bade. So simply walk across the quad to the thing that looks like a chapel but is not. It's an old library across the way uh, for more conversation and to uh, talk with our professors of practice and other members of the PSR faculty. Thank you again for coming and we look forward to seeing this massed crowd on May 13th as well. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, let's give a hand to our panelists and thank you all very much for your presence being here.